Welcome to Scream Quest, a Halloween spinoff of Screen Quest, your podcast where a fellowship of film lovers and armchair movie experts plays film roulette. I'm one of your hosts, Chris Waterman, joined by my fellow party members, May Finch. Hello, hello. And Will Rotondi. Hey, how's it going? It is going well. We missed a week because I was sick. I went to England for the Jaguars football game and came back with a virus that knocked my voice out. So apologies, listeners, if you were expecting an episode a week earlier. We're back on track, though. So welcome back, guys. On this week's episode, we're going to be talking about a pair of psychological horror films. First up, we have Silence of the Lambs, and then we have 2014's Creep, which was nominated by... Uh, who, uh, Grant Robertson, who was supposed to be on the show and sadly could not make it last minute. So thank you for the suggestion, Grant. I can't wait to talk about this film because I thought it was a, once again, very unique pairing of two films that fit the same like subgenre, mm-hmm. um, but couldn't be any different. So very, very excited for that. To start things off, we have one final side quest before we can like refresh our deck or maybe like reshuffle it. So we're going to draw this, and then all three of us are going to talk about the prompt. So without further ado, it is recency bias. So talk about your favorite horror film from the last 10 years is this prompt. So recency bias, favorite horror film from the last 10 years. Okay, so I would say nope. Um. Mm -hmm. And I know Nope is like kind of maybe a bit more sci-fi than straight up horror, but I really appreciated the various homages. Like there's an Akira slide and a bunch of other cool stuff in the film to various things from pop culture, as well as like the fact that it's a pretty well done, like I would say almost eldritch or cosmic horror, like by the end, um, and I appreciate the kind of like light touch on like showing the monster and keeping the monster kind of shrouded for most of the film up until the end. And I was really impressed that the effects work at the end did, I think, effectively convey how horrible it was. And I thought it was a really good visualization of the monster and kind of fit with how it had been hinted to previously. And that's really hard to do with like a giant alien entity um and i just liked all the layers of metaphor in it as well with like the kind of camera motif and the eyes and being watched and filmed and commentary on that and yeah i just thought it was really well done and definitely kind of a product of our current times um but like benefited from being able to pull on and reference so much stuff that came before it yeah there's a lot going on in that film like a lot going on and i i like the sort of twist of like the revelation of like what the aliens like are or what the alien is was very very cool and i will never forget the first time watching that chimpanzee scene that was oh, yeah. like mm-hmm. entirely in itself it was almost like a horror short that was like nestled in you know a film that was like about different kind of subject matter like that fucked me up like mm-hmm. i don't know i discovered i don't, I don't like apes i'll never want to own an ape <laughs> <laughs> those damn dirty apes <laughs> nope. did you see nope will i did i did um i liked it overall yeah i uh i like the films that that try to because it kind of made me feel a little bit like what i liked about signs where it's the you don't really see what's going on you don't really know what exactly in terms of like the alien is going to look like and so i like the build-up i like the it's dark i hear something i don't know what it is and it's just psychologically scaring the crap out of me so i'm always down for movies like that uh so mine is like I, i'm sure probably going to be somewhat of a controversial pick because people tend to either bounce right off this film or love it but 
uh mandy is is definitely my pick it's one i go back to over and over again i think visually it's just one of the most stunning things i've ever seen i love the soundtrack um it was the final score of uh johan johansson is his name and i like sought out a bunch of his music after it because i was just so struck by it Mm -hmm. um and i think it's just like it's a great example of how you can have a movie that is incredibly over the top like very over the top there's (laughs) bits of that movie where it is nick cage up to 11 and it still has a ton of like heart and emotional resonance Mm -hmm. like despite that it's also incredibly like violet which like i don't know like for a horror movie that's going to run towards that and can do some really fun unique things like with uh violence in that sort of color palette and it's one of those things if you've seen it you know what i mean like i think it it makes violence beautiful which is not always an easy thing like it doesn't really come off as exploitative it's just sort of like oh like in the way that kill bill i guess you know a different way Mm. than kill bill but like sort of like made like violence and art form almost like this does that as well um but yeah i i acknowledge some people see that movie and they're like nah i don't (laughs) care for this at all it's very trope trope filled um Mm -hmm. they show it in the trailer so i'm not spoiling anything but it is like the ultimate fridging of the girlfriend like that is like the core of what that that movie is Mm -hmm. but like Mandy being the you know the titular character and sort of the things that they do around that are are kind of interesting in ways like um and again I don't want to say too much like to spoil the film but um she's still sort of a presence like throughout it which is uh just interesting interesting way of handling that so yeah that's that's my pick um uh, definitely at least once a year watch that and more than once a year listen to the music like it's like my perfect I'm I'm working and I just need something on that's like got no lyrics or vocals and kind of keeps me grounded and uh, it's good good thing to write to honestly as well if you <laughs> are a creative writer so. you'll have to try it it's hard man it's hard because i think i gear more towards like the horror comedy aspect like when we watched would... ready or not li- last year that was i loved that movie <laughs> that was so good i, I had no good. idea about that movie and then when it got nominated and we watched it and i was like this movie is amazing <laughs> so <laughs> i'm gonna have to if it's if i'm not voting for that one i'm gonna have to go with megan because i really liked watching ai try to murder people that were being obnoxious <laughs> so <laughs> I, I don't megan. know yeah, it's so good. It's just, it's funny. It has dark moments. Um, if you watch just the regular cut, not the unrated version, then it's like super tame. It still has some good little jump moments, I feel like. Um, but more than anything else, it's just like a creepy baby, like a creepy doll that like has sentience that will murder you. <laughs> so <laughs> I, um, but I don't know. I mean, part of what I liked about that movie is there are times where you kind of want to root for her, though, because you're like, yeah, you know, beat the crap out of that neighbor or, <laughs> you know, beat up the little kid who's bullying your, you know, your best friend or um, I don't know. It's it's one of those things, too, where you watch it and you think as long as nobody like messes with Megan, like don't antagonize her and you'll be OK, probably like, I don't know, your chances are better. But I just love how in certain horror movies, it's like people get really wigged out about whatever the the thing is they're trying not to get hurt from, that they end up like doing things like assaulting or like beating up something that they should just like leave it alone <laughs> and, and things would be OK. I feel like that tends to happen a lot. Um, but yeah, I just I loved Megan when it first came out. And um, I think, May, you mentioned you might have seen the unrated cut. So it's yes. like a little bit like it has a little bit more fun and gore, but overall, like a little, yeah. but it's still quite tame. I would say, yeah. um, I mean, compared to like some of the stuff that, yeah, that we may have, <laughs> may have watched. But I agree. It's really good. And I feel like if like an AI killer robot doll sounds a little kitschy to you, like the, the human relationships in that movie are actually quite strong as well. And like, it's good acting performances. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, my biggest yeah. concern, like when I saw the trailers, was like, oh, is this just gonna be like a Chucky ripoff, like a child's play kind of thing? And it, and what I've heard is it's like it's quite a bit smarter than it maybe appears on the surface, like on like based on marketing materials and things like that. So um yeah. it is on the list to check out. Um I was intrigued by it. And I know people really liked it. 
I do like their discount Furby that they had at the beginning. That was <laughs> pretty solid. I'm like, where is that? Like, is that going to turn evil at some point? Because that <laughs> would be realistic. Did you say discount Furby? Yeah. Oh, man. Can't, uh, can't trust may, those Furbies, man. It might have been a little <laughs> before your time, but like, I can't understate like how fucking creepy those things were. Like, because like they would just wake up in the middle of the night and like beg for food and you're like uh, 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 okay like just now I don't like that your eyes are rolling around and you're like your your head and you're making little clicking sounds with your mouth like nah I'm taking those batteries out right now that's right <laughs> I, I'm waiting for like the sequel is going to be like a Tamagotchi that goes evil and like yeah that'd be that'll funny be, mm-hmm. that's right if you don't feed it enough then it gets angry and it comes after you I would I could see that. <laughs> Pitch it. Pitch storm. <laughs> Come on, A24, Tamagotchi. take my idea. <laughs> well, uh, hey, thanks. Thanks both of you for for sharing. Um, as we've already discussed, I think before the previous episode, horror is alive and well. And I'm continually continually surprised at how fresh that genre stays year after year. I feel like there's at least like one usually two really really good like horror films which like like it's a hard genre to get right in some ways like you know like there's a lot of crap out there but um so i kind of love that all right so the first question i have for you is which one uh which film do you want to talk about uh first in terms of uh initial impressions because we're gonna do initial impressions and then we're gonna kind of <laughs> delve into psychological horror as a subgenre and talk about a few things but uh who wants to give their first impressions on what first i don't know will has creep up in the background already yeah there you go we'll, we'll use will's like uh photo pick for to guide it so let's start with creep in terms of first impressions and then we can kind of bounce back and forth with the films uh similar to last episode where we talked about some of the elements of that particular subgenre so um will Give us your impressions of <laughs> Creep. Um, I like films like Creep because for some reason the found footage style appeals to me. I feel like for even as like over the top as some of them tend to get, or even sometimes as like arguably boring as some of them do tend to get with pacing, depending on which one you're watching. Um, I like how the the style for me tends to help me sort of like feel like I'm in it more like most horror movies I tend to detach from and this and like the found footage thing for some reason something about it sort of draws me in a bit more I will say I think it's interesting when people try to be a bit more creative about how they justify that there's found footage like when we watched wreck um last year that to me made sense because it's a you know a, a news reporter in creep it makes a little bit more sense too because we have you know the the main guy, Aaron, who is, I want to say it's Aaron. <laughs> I should know. There's only like three characters in this movie. If I can't remember one name. Yeah, it's Aaron. Um, yeah. So when Aaron's going out to the woods to do like this rando job that he found on like Craigslist or wherever that like it makes sense that you are like videotaping it to sort of have as like evidence in case you go like logically to sort of cover your ass um so i found that funny but overall just like the general impression of the film like i <laughs> i don't know what i was expecting going into it but i love it because it's just so funny it's like dark but so incredibly hilarious with just how weird joseph and his character um, just the stuff that he says that he does and then watching how much aaron just continues to accept it and go along with it like I don't know how many red flags you have to raise, man, before it's like, okay, maybe not a good idea. But I love the fact that Joseph seems to be just persuasive enough and Aaron seems to be just, I don't know, like whatever that is in the human brain that tries to justify why it's like, it's probably not as bad as I think. It'll be okay. I'm just going to do it. <laughs> like he's not really like going to be sense of, like not wanting to offend somebody. And right? remember, Aaron thinks he has cancer, so like I think part of it yeah. is like he's trying to <laughs> be empathetic, but yeah. So that yeah, overall, I just I I liked it. I it was it's not something that I probably would have gone out and watched, but it's the same way that I felt about Ready or Not, where I was pleasantly surprised to have 
something that I hadn't heard of that was a recommendation. So yeah, overall. And I, I mean, it was enough for me to want to watch the second one, like right after. So <laughs> anyway, but that's 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 very little. That's on my list to watch there. this week. I think sometime like uh, I do want to because I've heard two like was received even better than the first. And they were like, yeah, somehow like they managed to yeah. double down on this concept and like make it even better, which like cool. I'm waiting for the I'm waiting for the third one, man. Make it a trilogy. You know what? I know you. Uh, we talked about hating sequels, but after you watch the second one, I'm like, I still have questions and I want to see more. So just, just do it. <laughs> Hell yeah. I mean, if you have a plan in mind, I think like a trilogy is fine. It's those movies that like very much feel like they're standalones. And then like Hollywood comes in and it's like, let's find a way to like turn this standalone into a franchise where I get like kind of like. Yeah. Mm. May, how about you? What did you think of Creep? This hit me deep because I have done gig work for very rich families. And my God, does this nail the dynamic of being like uh like financially unstable millennial in the house of a very rich person, just trying to like not offend and get your money. And like your your tolerance for bullshit is very high. And you will get lots of weird bullshit. Like it's I don't know what it is if it's people that have just like gotten very comfortable paying other people to do random intimate stuff or what but like um the people like Joseph was initially trying to portray like seemed pretty accurate to me of like you know what the average person who's paying for a day of your time would do with you as weird and creepy as it was so I feel like I would not have seen the red flags at all oh man all right so may i have to ask and we can just cut this out but like what's the weirdest shit that you have ever been asked to do as a gig worker (laughs) (laughs) it's not like i've been asked to do weird shit but it's just like people are very comfortable around you when they're rich and you're just like in their Mm. house for some random job and like uh parents in like little clothing uh, like having me come in to teach their kids or like um just leaving me in the house by myself with their kid or just like seeing the crazy security setups and other weird shit some of them have in like random rooms that aren't closed off as they're leading me through their house it's just yeah do you ever walk over to their kids' artwork and be like, oh, this is the schizophrenic zone. There's a lot of activity down here. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I should have. I should have. But yeah, people like that will just randomly, like, I don't know, offer you like a drink or food when you're working. And it's kind of like, I feel like I shouldn't be taking this from you, but you're being nice about it. So I guess I will. Or like, it's on the drink know. or food like if it's like apple juice and some like you know n- dried nuts or something like sure if they're like yeah. here's a manhattan and like <laughs> like a like a filet mignon like <laughs> i agree with you like i don't know I, like I, like whenever like we have like somebody do like some of the more intense like you know landscaping and stuff like i always have like gatorade and water and stuff on hand like just in case yeah, like, they almost awesome. always bring their own but like that's awesome yeah, yeah. but <laughs> I don't know. You get a weird vibe sometimes. I also like was teaching the kids of like some single dads, and that definitely got a little weird. At time. Oh man. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, uh, uh, suffice it to say, th- this this film hit home. Uh- <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I um I I think like the the part that like or the parts that I could really um sympathize with was definitely not wanting to stir the pot, like on the part of like aaron's like bar because they i mean joseph kind of cruelly makes the joke at one point about like it's obvious that you need money because mm-hmm. you looked in the boot kind of thing and like you can tell a guy just wants to do his job and get paid um but yeah i, I appreciated the, the humor like this was way funnier than i thought it was going to be like i watched this twice in one day just because like marianne was like oh, i don't really care and i was like no you should like watch this like after i watched it and uh, speaking of the runtime and like being bored, like 70 whatever minutes, like perfect man, like that's a great runtime for a found footage film because there's really not enough time if it's moving at a decent pace for you to get 
like a little bit bored and on edge. Like, I think isn't Blair Witch like two hours? Like, I feel like there's points in that movie where I'm just like, man, all right, we're still out here in the woods, or I guess like you know, um, where he's like, this just it moved the entire time, which is really really good. Um, the self awareness is my by far my favorite part of the movie. So you allude like alluded to it a little bit, like. And that like, like he all, he's just always trying to convince himself that it's not as bad as he thinks. And like Joseph remarks on that at the end. And like, it just like, it's funny. Cause he, he says out loud, like what you've been thinking the whole time, which is like, no matter what I did or said to you, he just wanted to bleed. You know? <laughs> um, and and that, that's like, why you're one of my favorites. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Little hearts on the tape. Not to like jump too far to the, but yeah. And even like the, why didn't you turn around? It was so stupid. <laughs> <laughs> like, I, I just it was great like like that kind of subversion like um is perfect because the, the movie is like heading you off as the viewer at the past to be like yeah we're aware of the fact that like some of the stuff is tropey and sort of like irrational um and i i loved it all the more for that um all right we're gonna pivot to silence of lambs next for first impressions and then we're gonna dive into the psychological mm-hmm. horror uh, subgenre as a as a whole, and talk about how these two movies navigate it. So, maybe I'm going to go back down and start with you first for Silence of the Lambs. This is your first watch at this, correct? Uh, yes, actually. And overall, I really, really wanted to take a shower immediately after finishing it, and <laughs> uh. I was I was surprised that for a film that I thought would be a lot more gory, knowing about like cannibal the cannibal stuff and vaguely about the plot. Um I was like, wow, that wasn't as gory as I expected, but was way more unsettling than I expected because it nails what it feels like to be a woman and have like the male predatory gaze on you. Like I've never seen camera work like capture that quite as effectively as this film does. And it just uh it yeah. It was good. I'm glad that exists and that people can see what that feels like. But oof, oof. very, very unsettling. Um, I did get mad. I had a throw your popcorn moment uh, <laughs> when Hannibal like takes off the fake face in the ambulance. Because I'm like, okay, that EMT put a gas mask on you. There's no way they didn't realize that the skin on your skin wasn't your skin. <laughs> <laughs> yeah i I mean obviously uh, yes i agree with you i think the way they're trying to explain it away is that like oh his face was like so mutilated that like maybe Mm -hmm. the skin would be sliding around and all that stuff right because he's like he's a biter oh hannibal he likes to to do a little nibble nibble um but yes i'm with you 100 you gotta just you just there's some impossibility problems with uh like his escape that like it's better if you just roll with the punches i guess yeah but overall uh i wouldn't say i enjoyed it but i thought that it was a masterpiece deserving of its reputation yeah certainly the best hannibal films i think red dragon's my second favorite which is a prequel with edward norton and uh anthony hopkins comes back and uh ray fiends is the um serial killer that one called the tooth fairy i believe and that's a really fantastic film. Like it's up there, like not as good as Silence of the Lambs, but very close in my opinion. And then the sequel, Hannibal, which on paper should be great, is directed by Ridley Scott, is very uneven. And that movie is, I mean, it's gross. Like in like the, probably the way that you would imagine this one. Like there's a couple scenes that like people got up and left my theater and did not come back. And like we're audibly like gagging. Um better book though it's a good book just not as not as good in the film adaptation like that like it kind of verges on some uh some of the like more like okay i think you're just now trying to push audiences like tolerances a little bit and see what you can get away with versus like actually doing something that's unsettling with with restraint but mm-hmm. um, anyway will uh do you like silence of the lambs i do and it is because of the camera work because um I get creeped out having people like in this, like Anthony Hopkins just stare at me. Um, and I, I do. I think that it, the cinematography is pretty much what makes the film for me. And the story is like excellent. And Anthony Hopkins is phenomenal. 
And it's understandable if you would not want to be in a room alone with that man just based on this film alone. But <laughs> uh, I will say that, yeah, the camera works what stands out to me because I don't think I've seen anything else before, to May's point, um, that sort of puts you in, uh, that you become what is visualized by everyone. When Even when it doesn't start out that way necessarily, when the camera just sort of slowly uh, moves around and then you are the recipient through most of it and so that is that creeps me out watching it and I think it does an excellent job of doing that and I think that it's one of those things too where you don't necessarily you may or may not it may be more or less subtle depending on the viewer which I also appreciate where it's not just in your face the entire time but it it sort of creeps up and gets you so I think it's excellent in that regard but yeah, I mean, Anthony Hopkins, man, you can't <laughs> just the some of the stuff that I think he ad libbed in it too that just embodies the the absolute like I don't know the creep factor for better or worse the phrase to use for it and it's it is that's why it's I mean it's still like one of the classics right so yeah that's all I that's all I have to add to it it is <laughs> very unnerving. Yeah, all the more remarkable that uh, Mads Mikkelsen came along and like give, gives him a run uh, for his money in the the television show, which is like also is really true. like it's kind of a retelling of uh, a couple of the the novels and then sort of like some little ancillary stories and stuff. But but yeah, he's phenomenal. Um, I'll just add that like I like Clarice Starling is like one of my all time favorite like literary like detectives like mm. ever. Um, you know both the book and like the films for silence of lambs and hannibal's uh and hannibal sorry not hannibal's plural uh, that would be scary uh, I mean, that's oh, something no. we don't need as multiple <laughs> animals <laughs> running around um i just like i think it's it's quite amazing like the late 80s and the, the novel was published and then like the, you know this is like what 91 i think or mm -hmm. maybe even like 90 um that like there's like no romantic interest like you just have a very capable woman like doing like her job and mm -hmm like getting on with it and facing the challenges like they acknowledge sort of like the the work environment like that she's in like um with some of the biases that went along with it i'm sure in the 1990s and even like sort of the class struggles of the family that she came from um yeah it's just a phenomenal really 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 amazingly written character played well by jody foster um like she does it. it's a great job uh and then yeah i mean like what, what what's what's there to say that hasn't been said about this movie there's like scene after scene of memorable just creepy shit um like even right down to the title like i'll never forget like listening to that monologue the first time of like like the screaming of the lambs and like her running away like that just it sticks like there's so much about this movie that just sticks and um i love it my wife and i like uh really really enjoyed this and uh, at, at some point I um in the episode or um maybe adjacent to us publishing, I'll have to put a picture of us uh, last year for Halloween. Marianne went as Clarice Starling and I went as Buffalo Bill with his little kimono and uh, uh. I, I had a little precious <laughs> and everything. <laughs> I had some oh, man. makeup and like yeah, wig and all that fun stuff. So that was that was a fun couple's costume. Um except that like people when we were out and about kept asking me to open the robe up. And I was like, <laughs> 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 uh no. Um, and I will like finally add as like a weird aside when we were in England and I was getting my tattoo from Clara, we said that um, like we're a little bit um, intimidated by all the Buffalo Bill fans. And like she was very confused because she thought like Silence the Lambs didn't know it was an NFL team. And, um... and then she's like, well, she's like, you can tell them that they're all a bunch of Willie Tuckers. <laughs> like, <laughs> which nice. is like, that is now just forever. <laughs> the Buffalo Bill fans are Willie Tuckers. <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> um, but yes, I, I mean, it's like an all time great. I, I wore this VHS out like growing up um, just like over and over again, because I, I thought it was like the most perfect example of psychological horror and like sort of like in a lot of ways it, it's kind of a whodunit like without feeling like a whodunit right like the whole like mystery mm -hmm. is like who is buffalo bill um and you kind of figure that out early but you're watching her try to like figure it out and it's kind of an interesting way to do that story one of the things that i thought we could uh delve into right off the bat is so like one of those characteristics and i was researching this genre 
is uh, that it comes up over and over again in, in uh, psychological horror films and novels is characters sort of questioning their own sanity and like perceptions of reality and the situations that are that are happening. So I wanted to talk about how this uh, both of these films sort of tackle that in different ways and just kind of like delve into that a little bit and um, how you feel like each of them navigates it and is it successful or is it is it you know maybe not as as prominent or successful so um let's start with creep and then we'll go mm-hmm. back to silence the lamb so i think we kind of touched on this a little bit with aaron's like unwillingness to maybe accept that something's wrong there but um well why don't you ca- cap us off with that since i think you brought that up first <laughs> i love how <laughs> well first off I give a lot of credit to anybody that takes a gig that says like discretion advised that I'll pay you like what I'll pay you in cash, maybe a thousand bucks or however much it was to just do this video for one day up in some random location that's way out in the middle of nowhere. And I'm like, there is no way that I would ever. I mean, I don't care how strapped for cash I am. It would no. <laughs> and so that to me, I but I just love the fact that he just he goes with it and the stuff that Joseph asks him to do or says, you know, it comes across as like, you know, weird. Like when Joseph's like, all right, I'm going to go get in the tub. (laughs) Boy, (laughs) dude. And Aaron's like, wait, what? (laughs) (laughs) And Joseph's just like, yeah, come on, man. You know, (laughs) come up. No big deal. And then like tries to explain it away that, oh, he's doing this because, you know, he's got cancer and he wants to make a video for, his son so that when his son is born he can watch this video and spend time with his dad you know as just a tubby it's the yeah. man it was like uncomfortable a tubby right? with my dad i was like oh <laughs> i don't like that so and then like consistently as it goes on and you know, there's the little moments where um <laughs> joseph's like aaron I haven't been completely honest with you <laughs> and he owns up to stuff. And then he tries to like smooth it over and be like, but you know, I'm really sorry and I'll never do this again. And I just want you to know, I've always been like, I don't know. He, he, he tries to want to be like, I'm always truthful with you. Even when I've lied to you about something is basically what I got from that. And I love how, Aaron keeps trying to think, okay, it's just because he's sick. It's okay. And even after he finds out that Joseph has been lying about that and has been lying about it, having a family, I mean, he does try to get out. But even after that point, it's like he does all the wrong stuff about trying to go to the police. He doesn't give, like, he doesn't keep, he doesn't use, like, the actual physical video <laughs> to try and identify this dude to the cops. <laughs> of joseph and so it's like when he tried the the one scene you get where in a panic aaron has called the police and he's trying to explain what's going on and he feels like he's being stalked and it's like he the it sounds based on what we're hearing his responses to that the cops don't care or they don't have enough information to be able to do anything and so it aaron's just like okay well i guess i'm just gonna have to deal with this and it's like <laughs> man like, I don't know, that and when Joseph actually comes out to his house and starts doing crap around the outside of his house, like, that's when it really got to me. And I thought, okay, well, if anything's going to happen, I mean, it made sense. It was building to it. But I was like, all right, the humor's off. And now we were getting into some seriously weird stuff. But I love that even as as we even talked about before, as Joseph mentioned, like, Aaron just kept trying to, I don't know. He had a couple of moments where he was like, okay, nope, that's it. I'm done. But then he would like calm down and he would still think that he somehow he would be able to like control the situation or to like that it wasn't as big of a deal that Joseph wouldn't try and do something like murder him. I don't know, man. That was, I was really surprised by that part of it. But then again, you would need it to drive the film. So. Anyway, I have talked your ears off about that. That's that's pretty much where I'm, <laughs> how I feel about that part. Yeah, buddy. Like, I, I think like that's part of the absurdity of this film. It's just like 
despite how crazy things like escalate to just that he doesn't, you know, um, and I'm glad that they remark on it for the film. The tub thing would have been enough for me to be like, nah, like, even if I had to just be like, I'm not comfortable, like with like, you'll have to find somebody and maybe you should just be more upfront with that person on what you need. So you don't waste their time and vice versa. But like, I, I'm out, like I'm not filming a grown man in the, the bathtub. Like, like, I just, I would, my creep factor would be like off the charts and it'd be like, ah, sorry, buddy. Like not today. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I, uh, I, I think it gets like to the point of absurdity, like the, the rape story, like, like, I mean, in court, like yeah, he does try to escape like after that, you know, like to, to his credit, I guess, like he does, like, you know, sufficiently get creeped out to, to leave, but Yet somehow, despite that and all the other transgressions, like he does go to the park, which is just wild. But um, sorry, I didn't mean to, to jump ahead of May. May, go ahead. Yeah, uh, in three words, uh, gaslight, gatekeep, girl boss. Um, <laughs> Joseph is great at all three. And um, the the two things I really love about this film and how it kind of portrays like the warped manipulated worldview for that um joseph creates for aaron is one that like this is a stalking film and like largely a gaslighting film uh with like a male victim instead of a female victim which is different i feel like um that like kind of changes the dynamic a bit and like probably does play into part of why like the police kind of brush him off and like it adds more nuance to the situation um but i also love that uh it's very clear that even though aaron always sees joseph as like just a mentally disturbed man who like doesn't know any better and just really doesn't have any kind of social cues and just feels bad for him the whole time joseph is intent like intently aware of what he's doing at every step like this is very intentional manipulation and you can see that very clearly in the final shots of the film so this is just what he does with people he likes toying with them and collecting them and i feel like that makes it so much darker and it um kind of gets away from the like trope of like oh don't feel bad for the madman he'll still kill you at the end or that kind of thing um so i thought it was effective and like fairly refreshing use of that kind of device yeah, Joseph's certainly not um he's not a sympathetic monster in the way that like at times Hannibal tries to kind of come across or portray. Like when like I, I want to dive into that dynamic a little bit as we talk about perceptions of reality and sort of like unreliability of um the subject of the psychological horror. But like I feel like it's clear by the end of that film that Joseph has no remorse. He's very prolific, obviously, if we're to believe that all those tapes actually are people that he's done this to. Um, and, you know, like he's uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Like, he's just he's very good at what he does. And um, he's sort of gleeful and like his pursuits of, of that. Um, I do. I do sort of like the. The, the, he kind of does two different things like uh, he'll do like a little prank you know to, to put Aaron on edge so like a lot of the jump scares to the point again like uh, absurdity where at the end of the film I love that final jump scare because it was mm -hmm. like the obligatory jump scare and then he like turns the camera at himself and screams again like so it kind of again is like tell you the audience yeah we're aware that we've put this final jump scare in and it's a thing in psychological war and the fact that he's screaming into the camera at you is sort of us like giving you like the wing wing nudge 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 at the end of the film um and then he's got like the more sinister like sort of manipulation um that he does like i i think even like pretending to have cancer telling the story about the supposed like rape of, of the what like those are very calculated sinister things that are i think more deep rooted seeds of like discomfort that he's trying to plant within Aaron. Whereas like jumping out somebody and going, ah, like it's just about kind of putting him on edge in the moment. Um, so yeah, I kind of liked that <laughs> you saw different dimensions to like what his, his character was doing. And it's almost like the jump scares were a way for him to get his kicks, like in the short term while he was laying the, 
the further groundwork, I guess. Um, um, yeah. So like, I, I, anyway, like I, I did appreciate like that part of it. And I think like what make, made creep like the psychological and sp- uh, specifically like the character questioning their sanity was that they're pushing it to the absurd degree. It was a self-awareness where most logical people I think would have been out of there long before. And kind of what makes the film funny is that like, he's just going to like see it through like one way or the other. And agree to meet the guy at the park because he's like feeling secure and just, I don't know. Like there's many, many times where I think most of us would have like noped out of there and watching poor Aaron try to be polite and navigate it is funny. Like, I mean, it is funny. Um, The next thing I wanted to kind of talk about is the subjects uh, of the film, which are Joseph and Hannibal and how, our main characters, I think, meant to be sort of a substitute for the audience, like how they relate to those people and the kind of monsters that you build. I guess you could talk about Buffalo Bill to a lesser extent, but like he doesn't really interact with Clarice until the very end. And it's very much just a it's confrontational, whereas like the conversations that Hannibal and Clarice have and Joseph and Aaron have kind of are the the core of the film. So um, and how that, I guess, like leads to some of the psychological horror, because I think in one instance in Silence of the Lambs, like like Clarice knows that this person's a monster, whereas like Aaron doesn't in Creep, so it kind of adds interesting dynamics. But uh, May, I'll, I'll, I think I'll start with you. I'm gonna go go snake draft style again. Yeah, so I think that's extra unsettling. I think about like Hannibal and Clarice's dynamic is. I know you said there's not like a, a love story or love dimension, but there is like some tension between them. That is uncomfortable. Mm-hmm. Oh, that's not what I, I, yeah, I meant that. Um, yeah, sorry. Uh, yes, there very much is. Uh, what I was saying is like, I don't think that like Clar- like Clarice has like the traditional romantic interest in that film. In other words, like, I don't know the boyfriend that's at the FBI Academy with her. Right. Or like right. something else like, like, yeah. so, um, Oh, no, no, no. We'll, we'll, we'll talk about that. And, um, well, I mean, if you're bringing it up, go for it. But, uh, yeah, yeah, continue. Yeah. So that adds another layer of uncomfortableness with Hannibal because it's like, again, the camera's putting us it literally in Clarice's shoes at several points in the film. And we're supposed to empathize with her. And it's easy to do so in a lot of ways. But you see that she is also very sympathetic towards Hannibal. And, um, kind of like goes to him of all people for like comfort and um information obviously but like seems to like look up to him in a weird way and it um just adds a whole nother unsettling aspect to his character especially when uh like her friend is like hey aren't you worried that he escaped because he he was you know so close to you and She's like, oh, no, I think it, he'd consider it rude to come after me. Um, and it's just like so confident in how well she knows him and um, it, like seems rather disaffected by uh, the deaths of all of her colleagues. <laughs> kind of makes you wonder about Clarice and like um, her moral compass, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, it's funny that you say that because the ending of Hannibal the book was very controversial uh, I won't spoil it but like the Clarice the character like does something in there that like had like half the audience very angry and sort of like what and then the other half which was me was like no I feel like all these seeds have been there like all along and sort of like this feels like a natural progression um, in a lot of ways but um yeah uh i think you could argue like she goes to hannibal and looks up to him more than jack crawford who is her mentor at the fbi like she wants to please crawford but i think that's more of like i want to like be successful and have a job whereas like hannibal she seems to like really revere like his brain and how he looks at like criminal investigations Mm -hmm. yeah it does seem like she like is seeking fame and like psychological stimulation more than any kind of sense of like doing right by these people um and doesn't even seem like too particularly concerned about the the female victims um and it's interesting um so like i feel like that's the most informative aspects of hannibal obviously he um just like what we see as an audience member is kind of a straightforward like hungry monster right but like the added creep factor for me is just how clarice treats him 
um, and what their interactions look like. Whereas with Joseph and Aaron, Aaron feels bad too, but doesn't have that same kind of reverence for Joseph. No. It's more of, uh, I, I think Aaron has a basic like sense of moral obligation to any other person and like just happens to feel bad for Joseph. Um, would probably do the same for anyone. And that like, it makes it funny at the end when Joseph is like, and that's why he's my favorite. But um, also makes Joseph like into a clear monster because he could see that in air and was just playing on it for fun. Um, now I they, they like to play games, man. They, um, I mean, it's all just trying to. I don't. It's I, it's interesting watching it for. I think with those films, I, I find it more interesting watching it for the villains because I always wonder sort of like what it is they're trying to do and how they're going to accomplish it or what they're getting out of it. So in some respects, maybe that's why, you know, I, I'm not saying that I would chum up to Hannibal Lecter. Let's say, you know, let's go ahead and put that on the table real fast. Um, <laughs> but I do. I, I think that it is interesting how, you, the film is more about, um, at least for Silence of the Lambs, you know, it's more about him versus Buffalo Bill. I mean, Buffalo Bill is important and is sort of the the ultimate goal is to find him. But how Hannibal Lecter is sort of like he is sort of like the focus of the movie for so much of it. And and you kind of want to see him get come up and against like the guy who runs that institute where he's stuck at. And I wish I could, I am terrible with names. Uh, it's so Dr. Please. Chilton is the, yeah. Uh, yeah. So you're sort of like, again, it's, it's one of those weird moments in like a horror movie, kind of like Megan, where you're just like, yeah, but it would be kind of nice if he, if he just got a little comeuppance, right. For the guy who was such a jerk to him or thought he was his nemesis or whatever, you know, so he's that, an old friend for dinner, you know, I know. <laughs> Where even though you know it's bad, what he's going to do to him, and you're like, but you can't really, that's not really the the right thing. There's just like that little animal part of your brain that sort of thinks, okay, <laughs> interesting. <laughs> All right. Yeah. So I think that to me, watching the movies for that, it's like you think about in Creep where Joseph is just manipulating Aaron with all this stuff. And it's like, where are you getting out of it? Are you just, or are you like are you dealing with trauma that has led you to want to do this were you just sort of always like this did you uh like did somebody do like something like this to you and you know and so that to me i'm always interested in like what the ultimate goal is or if it is just you were just causing chaos to see what you can get away with and play around with this unsuspecting victim or suspecting victim and uh, until the final moment where you you know off him for whatever reason and so that to me was just interesting watching the two films because it's like both of them they're sort of playing games the whole way and you're just sort of wondering like what what's the next step going to be how are you going to try and get out of this is this really going to work are we relying a little bit on plot armor like what's the what's the the result and this is probably a little tangential, but I liked how you get thrown off a bit in Creep where you think, okay, is <laughs> did Joseph already just kill Aaron? Like, is he dead already? This movie's not over yet, right? You know, and so there's like a little fake out about that. And so I, I yeah, it's and then wondering at that point too, like, okay, so Joseph let him go. Is he done? You know, what's gonna happen next? Clearly he's not gonna be done. The movie's not over, but like we know what what's the next what's the end game and what's the next part that's going to come from that so that to me was what i liked about both films um the fake out was definitely a lot of fun where it's just <laughs> like almost too long shot of him carrying the stuff <laughs> up this weird hill which is like the most absurd place to bury a body anyway <laughs> um and then like when it the camera turns around and it's Aaron watching it and he's like i guess I don't know how to interpret this. It's like, you, you know, like, hopefully, you know, like what's, what's going on there. But um, yeah, I think like, like in both films, you have protagonists that at various points want to kind of please the monster, which is sort of interesting, you know, like the, uh, like Aaron, it's more of the earlier part of the film. Like I'm thinking like the hiking bit, like when they're 
kind of palling around going out to breakfast right um he bears a little bit of his soul and sharing something embarrassing again keeping in mind as an audience member you know we maybe have a little more information or suspicion but he thinks like okay this guy's dying like you know he's a little bit quirky and who knows like maybe this is just part of his grieving process so sure what's the harm and uh, Clarice you know sim- similarly I think like wants to show Hannibal how intelligent she is um your anagrams are showing doctor I always like that line you know when mm-hmm. she confronts him in the the jail cell when they've transported him up to DC or whatever um is a lot of fun and I think like it's interesting that you have like Hannibal who does escape and doesn't pursue Clarice like he has no interest in manipulating her and torturing her once he's like sort of in freedom whereas like Joseph's the opposite he's like no I'm going in I'm cutting off your hair and I'm banging on your window and all that kind of good stuff and I think um it makes the relationship uh, a little more romantic between as may said already uh like that little finger touch the finger brush uh between clarice and hannibal um there there is just this weird intimacy like with it um that like joseph and aaron like definitely um do not have that is a that is a fully abusive relationship if you're gonna kind of follow i guess that like that metaphor um where Aaron clearly just wants out, wants to be left alone. And Joseph is just continuing to sort of pursue him and send him stuff and do stuff to, to put him on, on edge. Um, but I do think like they're interestingly like compelling in very different ways or like Hannibal's like this intellectual, like monster who like, you know, has done terrible things. And like right up to the end, I was sure that Joseph was unhinged, but like I, I wasn't, I didn't know how far he was willing to go until he brought the axe on Aaron's head. Like, I, ge- I genuinely didn't know if it was just going to end with, like, him, like, I don't know, pooping in a bag and lighting it on fire and then, like, being like, gotcha. <laughs> like, you know what I mean? Like, it kept me guessing. Like, I was like, all right, like, how like how unhinged is this guy? Like, what's... um? I certainly didn't believe him when he was like, oh, I'll meet you in this public place. Like, I knew something was going to happen, but I w- didn't think it was going to be that. Um, and I'll point out, like, my other favorite, like, uh, fake out speaking of that scene is, like, the chainsaw revving in the background. Right. Yeah. I was expecting to hear him like, or see him come like running into the frame. And I was like, Oh God. And it's like, yeah. Oh no, no, it's not. Um, yeah. Very, very different, but kind of similar relationships between those, uh, those protagonists. All right. Um, I think we jumped over, or I should say I jumped over because uh, my brain's all over the place today. Um, talking about the questioning of reality of silence of the lambs, or did we, did we cover that? Did I skip past that? Yeah. Yep. All right. So, so we can we can loop back to that. That's fine. Um, because I, I am kind of interested to hear, um, that film sort of deals with, um, perceptions of reality and and sanity in a, in a much different way than Creep. Uh, and in particular, like I think we can kind of link that to Hannibal and, and Clarice and like how willing she is to sort of like want to put stock into the things that he's saying and almost look past um who he is like at his core which is like i mean he's a person that's done terrible terrible things um and then i guess to some extent we could probably touch on buffalo bill we probably shouldn't go the whole podcast without talking about buffalo bill a little bit and uh his perceptions of of reality notably himself and like um the women that he uh unfortunately kidnaps and turns into garments so um well i'm gonna start start with you first like um, yep. wherever you want to kind of go with that but like it, like I think there are some interesting questions of like I don't know like what someone's willing to um to look past uh as far as Clarice goes and then yeah Buffalo Bill and how he interprets the world so yeah, I was gonna say Buffalo Bill was what I was thinking about in terms of questioning reality um <laughs> and about feeling like you need to put on a, a people's skin in order to transform that's probably where i would be. that's that's all i've got sure. <laughs> that's literally that's it that's my final answer on that one um i mean i do think it's in a in a macabre way i think it's an interesting i think it's interesting that the human mind for that character would be warped enough that that's what they feel like they have to do 
So I would say that sort of like the same aspect that is, I'm sure, intriguing to Hannibal and to Clarice about why it is that people do things like that. Um, But I can I just can't imagine what that would be like to be that kind of character and what that drive would be like in order to feel, I guess, in some respects, if we wanted to, like, take it. Uh, I don't know. This is going to be like me rambling on again. Um. <laughs> <laughs> like whatever it is that uh, that a person individually feels like they need in order to feel complete where they need to feel like themselves then if that's <clears throat> his driving force then that is very unfortunate that that is what feels like the missing piece in your evolution of a, as a person um so they mentioned like earlier in the film like because like i'm glad you're bringing it up like that he was probably rejected for like sex reassignment uh mm-hmm. surgery at the, the places that would have done it at the time do you buy that like had like the operation gone through like (laughs) would have been like complete and whole like um like or no yeah okay like i yeah neither do i i thought that was sort of an interesting um angle i can't remember if they go into it in the book more about like his origins or anything but like i've always been curious about like where that person started off and like the journey of like because you get little glimpses and comments from like Hannibal in terms of like his journey towards transformation um but I think it is like it's fucking it's so creepy like the butterflies or the moths like I just like everything about his aesthetic is like very very unsettling um you know, I mean, just, I could relate to the fact that he likes animals more than people. I mean, that's fine, but like, yeah. maybe not killing people, you know, like, let's just let's watch ourselves here. Yeah. But um, uh, the and the sex reassignment, um, I think that and when they brought that up, I also feel like that's sort of um, it's a good point to bring up only for the fact that unfortunately, that seems to be like an excuse. A lot of times people worry that that is like the driving force behind when people seem to be um, seem to have some sort of psychological concern. And I I think that it's important to recognize that that's not the case. I think yeah. that this, this is obviously something else that is, you know, and that and having that sort of surgery, I I am confident would not have been the solution to that problem. Problem, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's one of those things. Like, I don't know that the the film and maybe the book does the best job. Like, I think they try to navigate. Like, he, Clarice makes the comment of like, "Oh, there's no like relationship between, you know, like people that are transsexuals and like." You know, violent like killer. I think they they're trying to be like, hey, we're not drawing that connection here. So yeah. doesn't do the best job, but um, yeah, like it's one of those things that like I've always wondered, sort of like where they were going or what they were trying to imply by like saying like, oh, he was rejected. I think because he had other psychological issues that like they recognized and maybe you had to meet criteria. I don't know what it was like in the nineties for that, but like, um, maybe they saw like violent tendencies and. I don't know if that barred you from having that kind of surgery. I have no idea, but, um, but I always kind of wonder what, like, all right, so what are they getting? Like, what's he getting at of like, he was rejected for this. So now he's like transforming in a different way. Is it just, he wanted to change fundamentally. Like if body modification, like, like cyberpunk shit was around with Buffalo Bill be like, uh-huh. Oh yeah. Like, let me get like a cybernetic eye and then I'll be this like crazy killer with a cybernetic eye. I, I don't know. But um, I do, I think the moth motifs and some of the other like stuff is really, really, kind of interesting at least like with that uh that character um and the the humans clothes like uh, like when he's ma- yeah. doing all so the sewing job's gross how about you may um <laughs> what do you make of buffalo bill's perception of reality and sort of like how they grapple with that uh very similar to everything you two have said um like i appreciate the movie trying to draw that line and like not be transphobic um, but I feel like it doesn't come across in the best way. And to me, like after sitting with it for a while, I was like, okay, I think the line they're trying to draw is that like for something like a sex reassignment surgery, it generally is like a very personal form of like gender dysphoria where it's like related to like how you feel in your own body. Whereas mm. Buffalo Bill covets, right? Like he sees another woman and wants her skin. And 
that I think is like the difference and probably kind of what came through in his assessment of like, oh no, this, this guy just like wants to like possess and own and wear a woman, not doesn't and doesn't actually have like internal gender dysphoria. Yeah, um, that's a good point. I like that. So, but I had to do a lot of thinking about that because it really did rub me the wrong way. <laughs> um, and I feel like the movie does not draw the line the best way. But like it did make an attempt of just saying something for, you know, a 90s movie. So. Yeah, yeah. Or late, like late 80s, like novel. Like you could see that they're trying not to like. Yeah. You know, like the intent, I think, was there. It's just like, I don't know that number one a lot of that was probably talked about as much like um in uh pop culture or like what's the word i'm like mainstream like works of art um at the time so yeah yeah i think like it's also telling that he doesn't like want to replace his skin with their skin he just wants to wear it on the outside and like flaunt it right like it's yeah um (laughs) <laughs> I definitely kind of thinking of it that way makes it fit in better with the film's other themes of kind of like a predatory gaze and like a consuming gaze. Um, and yeah, very unsettling. Um, I wish the film had done a bit better job of like, <laughs> for choice, flushing his character out. But <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um. But I feel that way about Hannibal, too, because, like, you see that he's, like, supposed to be the super smart guy, or at least does a good job of coming off as smart to Clarice, and, like, you <clears throat> don't really get any backstory or information on his, like, cannibalistic urges, and that would have been interesting. And instead, it's kind of seen as almost an aside to his character or a plot device for to explain why he's so feared and so tightly controlled. I think it's like so this was the second novel and like a lot of people had read Red Dragon. And um, there there was t- technically our boy Michael Mann of Heat fame made uh, an adaptation of Red Dragon called Manhunter, I think is what it's called. Manhunt or Manhunter? I always like maybe I'm mixing up Manhunter and Manhunt, but uh, I had Brian Cox like from Succession is Hannibal the Le- Hannibal the Cannibal in that, and um, it is like a straightforward adaptation of that um, that story. But a lot of people I think were familiar with the character and like the film kind of like just like glosses. Oh, it's Hannibal the Cannibal. Like yeah, like you know this guy. Um, they delve a little bit into it like in Red Dragon. Like I can't remember if it's a flashback or the first chapter, but you see how he's caught. And then, like, the kind of the crux of that story is, like, Will Graham, who's another character who's, like, in the TV show, which is a prequel um, to even, like, Red Dragon, um, and, like, what Hannibal was up to and sort of, like, like the infamy. It's gross. Like, it's real gross. <laughs> um, if you like body horror and, and that kind of stuff or don't like it, um, whatever, like, if uh, like if it creeps you out, like, it, like, dials it up to 11. But, but I do feel that. Like, I remember immediately wanting to go to read the books like after seeing this film because i was like well i want to know more about like this guy and what he was up to and red dragon was a little more satisfying and giving you some some background what do you think buffalo bill's like final form in his mind's gonna be like if buffalo bill was like a pokemon like (laughs) what is he like where does it stop with him like what's his final evolution like what do you think that looks like because like that's another thing that i'm like you know, obviously he's got some sort of end goal in mind, like whether it's obtainable or not. Like, is it just he makes the woman suit and like he feels like fulfilled? Is it now he's going to make like a whole catalog of of like women's fashion? that's <laughs> just women's suits. Like, I just like it's kind of creepy to think like if this guy's not caught, like what what does that look like? Because he's building towards something. I don't think he is. Like, he's I think he's just going to. I, I, I think because this film is so much about like very animalistic and predatory urges and like hunger at a fundamental level, I think he's not going to stop until he dies or is caught, right? Like that's, yeah. and I don't think there is a stopping point for him. Like you, you kind of see that in the metaphor of the lambs as well, right? Like they all had to get slaughtered, even the one that got away with Jody. Mm-hmm. Oh, man. 
Yeah. Now I want to take a shower just talking about the talking <laughs> about this movie. <laughs> um well that those are the only like sort of like topics that I had pre-baked for for this. Um so I'll open it up like again sort of like um free form jazz. Like anybody have anything else <laughs> that they wanted to touch on for either of these films? Um, or psychological horror itself is like a genre here's one random question who would you rather go up against like in a like you're mm, trapped um we'll say semi-isolated maybe not like middle of nowhere middle of nowhere but like you know like you have to pit your wits and brawn like against one of these two mm. <laughs> I mean, easily Aaron for me like I was gonna say yeah he doesn't bite <laughs> <laughs> well and also like I feel like if you just let him think that he's like confusing you and get like like you know he gets he's easily drugged and duped like yeah or it's like Hannibal I feel like that dude he'd be playing chess and I'd be over here like playing checkers you know what I mean trying to outsmart him <laughs> yeah well you may Aaron or, or Hannibal Joseph right Oh, sorry. Yeah, Joseph. Yes, not Aaron. <laughs> I was gonna say if we can pick Aaron, I'd pick Aaron. He'd be easy. <laughs> yeah, he. Uh, I think Joseph takes Aaron's name in the second film. I had read mm-hmm. somewhere, so I think that's why. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Oh wow. Okay. Yeah. Well, uh, in that case, Joseph's <laughs> not Aaron. Yep. Um, <laughs> for the same reason as well, Joseph doesn't bite. Um, I feel like I would have a harder time like psychologically fending him off. But the second things got kind of violent or like I got like a clear red flag, I would, you know, run or fight him. I feel like I can stand decent chance against Joseph. For sure. Yeah. All right. So unanimous there. <laughs> Joseph over <laughs> over yeah. cannibal to cannibal. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, you need a really uh... you need a good gun against Hannibal. Like a really good gun. <laughs> Or um, I feel like just open sp- like maybe you could outrun them. You know, I just wouldn't want to be in like a, a home or house with like or up close. You know what I mean? Like a little bit of distance. Like he's a bit older, right? I think like he's supposed to be in his fifties, maybe. Work on that cardio. <laughs> yeah, like, I don't know how how good his cardio. He's been locked up in the cell for a while. It's probably not like the most limber of, of folks. <laughs> <laughs> I just hope that guy gets shin splints and can't catch up to you. All right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's a chance, right? <laughs> That's a chance. Uh, <laughs> Sweet. <Yep. laughs> All right. Well, hey, let's let's. Oh, go ahead. I was just gonna say my my last thought is I do really appreciate like the the humor of Creep and how it kind of inverts things. Like for me, the least scary scene is when he puts that like ridiculous wolf mask on. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I was laughing uh, my ass pizzas. off. Uh, he's like growling at him and he's like, quit, man. Like, quit, quit. Yes, yeah, well, great. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like the stereotypically scary stuff is the least scary stuff in creep, and I think that's impressive. Yeah. Like kind of by by design as well. Like um like even the jump scares like by the end or were just like I laughed more than I was like scared by them because they just happened over and over again again probably making a statement of like hey a lot of found footage movies like that's what it kind of boils down to is like we're going to build enough dread so that like the jump scare like hits um yeah love it if you get a chance to like def- well I imagine you 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 may or may not, but it, I would recommend it to anybody who's listening to check out Creep Two because I really like it, it when he finds somebody that gives back to him what he dishes out, and it's entertaining in that respect alone. So, yeah, that and that's all I want to say about it because it was it was pleasantly surprising again just how well it turned out and how much I wanted to find out how it was going to end. So, all right. So for for our, our closing segment here, we're going to take turns setting up our own sort of Joseph s catfish like scenario, and the other two people can decide how plausible or like successful that would that would be for them in terms of like maybe getting somebody to uh, come to you. So we'll, we'll kind of rate like 
the the setup um and then like sort of the escalations and manipulations so you can talk about like what you would do if you were gonna mess with somebody or i mean we can go do you guys just want to like go for the full enchilada like you're gonna kill somebody <laughs> <laughs> how I would mean... you do it <laughs> <laughs> i thought we were just, just so... messing with people okay okay <laughs> we can keep it we'll keep it a little more passive I'm just saying, I, like... I have to use my plans for killing for the fiction that i write chris yeah yeah you don't want to tip your hand you know what i mean like yeah it's a good point good point i have All one right. It's somewhat yeah. Midsommar inspired. Nice. Yeah. <laughs> um, for this one, the premise, rather than being that I'm dying of cancer and making you know a video for my kid, it would be that I'm dying of cancer, but I found a dietary solution that I want to share with the world. Oh. And I would just eat increasingly weirder and more disgusting foods and insist that the videographer take part in eating them. <laughs> 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 what? Um, yeah so about the food or, or... <laughs> is there any sort of I romance need, that's I'm trying to be suspicious. involved in this about like yeah. yeah about seducing somebody because i feel like that was <laughs> came up the most that's what i remember from that movie no, so i would tell them that like oh yeah that has like a little bit of like my hair to make it yeah. work or a little <laughs> that's bit what of I was saying, yeah <laughs> <laughs> Oh yeah, mm, like here, look, we're just gonna crunch. clip off our big toenail. We're gonna throw yeah. it in the food processor. <laughs> it, it it boosts the uh, the white blood cells. Like ah, oh, that's mm. gross. Yep. I that's think that's a pretty way. good one. <laughs> that's right. I'm, yeah, I'm gonna do that by food. Yeah, what's what's the grossest thing you can get or you thought you or you think you could get away with like having somebody like. <laughs> ingest uh, in the name of eggnog. health hairy eggnog Where the, <laughs> where's the hair coming from <laughs> you, you can't you can't give away talking about pit hair right? we're talking about like, <laughs> leg hair? like i would claim that the hair came from a rare chinese species of dog and uh <laughs> dog hair <laughs> it's actually a delicacy okay <laughs> Oh, that's great. Uh, dog hair eggnog. Why eggnog, too? <laughs> Jesus. Mm. Uh, just um, the texture of that, like the thickness of eggnog with like the Little just irritant just of hair, like, like just getting raw hair. hair. <laughs> oh, <gosh. laughs> that's really, truly horrible. Kind of like your sink got clogged and now it's just like, bloop. yeah. <laughs> oh, there you go. I'm a Dream. I'm a horror writer with GI issues, Chris. What did you expect? <laughs> <laughs> write what you know. They say write what you know. So, <laughs> um, mine's on a more grandiose scale. Like uh, uh -huh. so this is inspired by Fire Festival. So, <laughs> you create a music festival, and like all of the staff that you hire to like do the food, the stage setup, and everything, you have them sign NDAs, and you stage like a major zombie outbreak so like the middle of the night when everyone's like sleeping in their their tents and everything like you get everybody like in full makeup and just like ripping open tents you're either staggering through like you're clawing at people in their cars like <laughs> trying to leave i think that would be like the most fucked up like grand scale like major hoax prank like you i mean just tens of thousands of people unsuspecting and then stage like a massive like zombie outbreak um the question is like do you do a day of legit music like <laughs> you pull everybody you just, like, into a false sense of security or do you or do you just have like a fire festival level disaster where like like the food sucks i think that's what you do you do fire festival level like the food sucks like technical difficulties all day everyone goes to bed real hungry and on edge and then you unleash the the, the zombies or or alien whatever whatever kind of like horror like on a massive scale like you do it um yeah, you would be sued into oblivion for that for sure. Like, <laughs> but there you go. That's how that's how you could do like, I mean, it'd be a legendary prank for sure. Probably a lot of people would get hurt, unfortunately. <laughs> but I'm just thinking about the War of the Worlds broadcast now. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yep. that's true. Hundred percent. You'd probably end up with some stabbings. Trampling for sure. I feel yeah. like that's like, yeah. 
be it wouldn't be a nice thing to do to be clear <laughs> i know i'm laughing but like <laughs> and he'd make all this money off of people too oh yeah oh you're gonna need it probably for all the, the for the, yeah, the lawyers <laughs> nice. yeah. mm. well all right so i'm gonna take a little bit of um joseph slash aaron's slight playbook and instead of doing a little locket with pictures i would create little action figures of people that would model them or you know what if i'm not that creative and i can't 3d print like a little action figure of somebody maybe i'll just stick their face on like a little doll and set up little scenes with them and then maybe one of those little scenes might have like I don't know, maybe an axe or maybe something else that's just being acted out in a little diorama to just unsettle them to see how they feel. Or maybe invite those people to come and play with their action figures and we'll all just oh like, God. have fun together and we'll act out a little scene. And then, yeah, we'll go with that. I like the participation aspect of it. Of like, That's right. You get a chance. I got this character and it's like their name. <laughs> All right, we're going to act out this scene. It's like this this character's name. And it's like, oh, like after me? Like, nah, it's not you. And then just yep. proceed to like do horrible things. <laughs> 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 oh my God. That's great. I yep. hate that. But also you're reminding me that there is a girl in my dorm in college that made Sims of everyone else in the dorm and was kind of doing that with Sam. Oh, she knows what's yeah. up. All right. right. I'm telling you. Like wall them in a room and stuff like that. (laughs) I've seen some crazy things on Reddit with Sims. (laughs) I I I don't want to give details. Okay, fair enough. Yeah, we'll save that. She left the school after the first year. Oh well. Where is she like, there's a, that's the real question. <laughs> there's a lot going on. <laughs> She's writing under the name May Finch. No. <laughs> dun dun dun. The plot twist. <laughs> no, I don't think I even know the Sims. Yeah. It was never my jam. Well, thanks for uh both sufficiently um creeping me out with your, your food and your play acting scenarios <laughs> <I'll get it. laughs> uh, that's a that's a quote for the books <laughs> <laughs> thanks for creeping out with your food and your play acting scenarios yeah <laughs> uh so on the next week's episode um we are going to be tackling isolation horror but uh, i'm excited because i love that subgenre as well like nothing like putting a bunch of people in a isolated situation and seeing how things play out very very cool but as always we appreciate your support thanks for listening and watching the show wherever you get it you can find us on x at screen quest pod and we will see you next week bye bye, bye guys <laughs>